Get started. Uh, time to start. So we're pleased to have John Embry to talk about self-avoiding walk and branch tolerance. This is a review of the subject, I guess. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, I want to try to keep things uh, really simple and basic, at least to begin with. And uh, uh, so I'm going to do some very basic uh, stuff about just complex variables. <laughs> and uh, we're going to move on to how that might say something, um, move on to n dimensions, and then learn something about self avoiding walk. And then these uh, extend these identities to talk about branch polymers. That's sort of the the plan. Um, actually, let me uh, before I get started. Let me. Uh, I did want to start with this. Um, there's this nice little Java applet, and I wanted to start it, and then maybe one. When I get to starting talking about self-avoiding walk, <laughs> we'll see how. So this is an applet from BU where they generate two-dimensional self-avoiding walks, and keep the statistics, keeping track of the statistics in real time. All right. So let me. Uh, so is that that looks like it's it's they're trying to generate it, not looking at putting equal weight on the pad. Is that an accurate applet? Um, <laughs> well, they, they generate up until a point where there's an intersection and they stop. Um, that's, that's the algorithm they use. But does, that, does that properly generate? Uh, it gives a um, distribution of length. Uh, it's not just the equal weighting on one. Uh, okay. Although I, if there is an issue with the weighting, that I, I couldn't comment on that. But I just grabbed this off the internet for, for fun. Uh, anyway, so let me put that away for now. So um, some basic facts about the complex numbers. All right, uh, specifically Gaussian integrals. If I want to do um, this integral, Then uh, I can change variables t equals x squared plus y squared e to the minus a t. And then we have pi dt. So we get pi over a. OK, I think we can agree with that. Um, but uh, I want to use. Uh, phi and phi bar. So let phi is equal to x plus i y. Phi bar is x minus i y. And we can just rewrite this. Um, and I'm going to be using um, wedge products and such. So let's write d phi wedge d phi bar is minus 2i dx dy. Just by expanding that out, you can see this is the case. Um, so if you write this identity in terms of d phi and d phi bar, it looks like this. But we get this funny factor of 2 pi i minus 2 pi i over a. All right, now, um, I want to do something which looks a little strange. I'm going to write this part, the measure, as an exponential also.
Um, but uh, anyway, this is, these are differential forms, so uh, they ob obey the exterior algebra. If you take powers of them, um, you're going to get zero. So in fact, uh, this whole exponential, the only term that contributes is the linear term, the first term, minus a times d phi wedge d phi bar over 2 pi i. So this then is equal to the integral e to the minus a phi phi bar. And then I get a minus 1 over 2 pi i, so actually minus a over 2 pi i d phi d phi bar. But by the previous line, the integration gives me a, the inverse of this factor that I have there. So I get 1. So this is kind of a baby version of identity that I'm going to be using um, in n dimensions. So I thought it would be good to make sure we understand it in one dimension. Now one thing that's uh, it's a little bit um, trying to have to keep writing all these factors 1 over 2 pi i all the time. So I'm going to let um, psi is equal to 1 over uh, is d, uh, d phi over root 2 pi i. And psi bar is d phi bar over root 2 pi i. And then I can use a shorthand notation, tau is phi phi bar plus psi psi bar. Now that looks a little bit more symmetrical between the phi's and the psi's. And so this identity here becomes just uh, the integral of e to the minus a tau is equal to 1. Now, uh, you'll notice that some of my integrals here don't have any d's in them, right? <laughs> I didn't put a d in here because it's built into tau. Tau includes these psi's, but psi's are just uh, a d phi and a d phi bar in disguise. So that's where the integration measure comes from. Okay, now this is a nice identity. Actually, more generally, you can do the following thing. Um, if you have any function, f, um, then um, I can expand this out. Uh, so it would be f. Well, what is it? It's f of phi phi bar plus psi psi bar. Uh, but remember, these are, in fact, uh, two forms. So the, the definition of this would mean that I would, I'm assuming f is uh, a smooth function, so I can differentiate it, and maybe it dec decays at infinity. Uh, it's a function on the reals. So um, if I expand this out in a Taylor series, I get phi phi bar, f of phi phi bar, and then the derivative times psi psi bar. But of course, this term actually uh, gives zero because it's form degree zero, and uh, we're the only things you can integrate over the complex numbers are things of form degree 2. So only a second term contributes. Um, and now if I reintroduce, put it over here. If I reintroduce the, phi, um, the d phi's, 
I get f of prime of phi phi bar d phi d phi bar over 2 pi i. And I can go back into radial and angular variables. Um, so this is going to be f prime of, uh, let's let t equals phi phi bar as before, f prime of t. And then we've got um, uh, well, what it, this is really um, get the minus two i, the x dy, which is um, the x dy is equal to dt times pi for the d theta when you have an invariant integrand. So two i pi, and then we have a divided by two pi i. and a dt. All right, so and this t goes from 0 to infinity. So we get minus of um, f of infinity minus f of 0. Uh, but since I said it was decaying, we're getting f of 0. All right, so I said this is a general version of this previous identity. Uh, in this case, f was just an exponential function. And when I did the integral, um, this was the integral of e to the minus a tau, right? So the function is the exponential function. When I evaluate it at 0, I get 1. What I've shown here is the more general fact, any function that decays, it's reason as differentiable and so on, if I integrate it in this fashion over the complex plane, I get its value at the origin. So what we have here is a, ba is a baby version of uh, supersymmetry where supersymmetry involves uh, expanding the variables to include anti-commuting variables. In this case, we're just using uh, differential forms and the anti-commuting aspects of the exterior algebra of differential forms. And it just so happens because of this sort of rotation invariance um, that there are certain identities that you can derive. Um, and you could go into the, more of the group theoretic aspects of these identities, which I'm not intending to do today, but that's, uh, you can go into it more deeply as to why these facts and the, more, and the generalized versions of these facts are going to be valid in n dimensions. Um, one other set of facts I need to know is a little bit less um, uh, exciting, let's say, <laughs> the basic facts about uh, Gaussian integrals that I need to know in order to get, say something about self-avoiding walks. Uh, that's integration by parts. And again, I'm going to prove the formulas in the simple case, the one-dimensional case, and then just state the analogs in uh, n dimensions. Integration by parts. Uh, phi is equal to uh, d by d phi bar, um, actually minus 1 over a of d by d phi bar of e to the minus phi a phi bar. And um, therefore, if you put this in, into an integral, integral of f, some function of phi and phi bar, let's say, and if I integrate that times phi e to the minus phi a phi bar, d phi d phi bar. But you don't mean that first line. You got you got uh, you got a factor on the left side, right? 
This one here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, the measure is still there. So phi e to the minus phi a phi bar. Okay, so um, if I just make this replacement in here, and then integrate by parts the d by d phi bar onto the f, I get I get a minus sign which cancels that minus sign, so I get the integral of um, d f d phi bar, and then a one over a e to the minus phi a phi bar, d phi, d phi bar. So this is um, the basic uh, formula that you can use to evaluate moments of Gaussian integrals. Uh, for example, if I were to integrate phi phi bar, and I'm going to against uh, d mu a. I'm just going to let d mu a be uh, just this e to the minus phi a phi bar minus psi a psi bar. It's a normalized measure because of the fact that the integral d mu a is equal to 1. By integration by parts, this phi turns into a phi bar derivative, and it eats up that phi bar, so I just get 1 over a. And more generally, if you had, let's say, phi phi bar to the n, d mu a, uh, I guess I would get n factorial over a to the n because you you keep on um, applying this um, conversion of phi's into d by d phi bars, uh, but then uh, there would be n choices for the first one as far as which phi bar it would differentiate, then n minus one choices for the second one, and so on down the line. That would give you the uh, n factorial. So these are called the Wick rules. for Gaussian integrals, which enables you to evaluate moments of Gaussian measures as sums of products of covariances. In this case, the covariance uh, matrix, or covariance is just the number. It's the inverse of the operator A, or the number A, which appears in the Gaussian measure. OK, so that's all we need for the complex numbers. Now, let's move on to Cn. Um, so in Cn, what am I going to do? I'm going to take um, Similar variables, so I'm going to have phi 1 up to phi n. And we're going to, instead of a number a, we're going to have aij is a positive Hermitian matrix. Uh, so, for example, it might look like something like this. Uh, for let's say G is a graph, connected graph on one through n. Uh, and then you would say uh, phi a phi bar, which is the sum of phi i. A i j phi bar, i j going from 1 to n. Uh, 
uh, these are the sort of things I like. Some A I J. So I J be lines in the graph. And then um, phi i minus phi j squared. And um, maybe the vertices in the graph, a i phi i squared, where the a i j, a i positive, strictly positive, let's say. Yeah, um, and there's a, you can connect the little a's and the big a's. You can read one off the other, but go back and forth. So this is kind of like a, um, just a generalized version of the Laplacian on the graph. Anyway, I'm just gonna, that's just an example. Let's, um, now I'm going to try to prove some analogs of these identities here. Um, so for this one, what I want to do is I want to take the integral of e to the minus phi a phi bar, and then I'm going to have to take the wedge product d phi i d phi i bar i going from 1 up to n. OK? That's the n-dimensional version of what I had here. And what do you get? Well, you get minus 2 pi i to the n over the determinant of a. All right? I'm, I'm sure many of you know this formula, but I just thought I would put it down there. It comes from, ultimately, you could just diagonalize the matrix, and then it becomes a product of the eigenvalues uh, in the denominator. So that gives you the determinant. So that gives you the n-dimensional version of this formula. Um, as before, we're going to um, replace these phi's and d phi's. So psi i, for example, is going to be d phi i over root 2 pi i. Psi bar i is d phi bar over root 2 pi i. Just to save notation, save writing. And then we've got a formula analogous to the one that I have here at the bottom of the board, which is that if I integrate this using the exponential to reduce the integration measure rather than writing it out explicitly, I get 1 again. Now this is slightly uh, a little bit less trivial than the one on the, that I had before in one variable, but you could still see how this arises. Uh, basically, in order to uh, now we have a, we're integrating over c n, so we have to have a form of degree two n in order to get something non-zero. That means I would have to expand this exponential up to the nth uh, term, so I'd have something like psi a psi bar to the n over n factorial. And remember, the psi's are really the d phi's in, in disguise. So I have the right degree then. And you can certainly imagine that using the exterior algebra, which is implicit in these um, for, uh, generators for the exterior algebra, uh, that's going to basically anti-symmetrize and produce the sum that we know and love for the determinant of A. OK, 
Okay, so that gives us this identity. And I guess I can uh, continue to use this notation here, except I'll put brackets now indicating that we're doing the full n-dimensional version. Now, I have this more general form of the identity where I had an arbitrary function and I proved that the integral of the function was the same as evaluation at zero. Now this is a not quite as straightforward. You can't just uh, get it by simple integration by parts. But what you can do is use linearity. We're trying to, to show the integral of f of ta equals f of zero. Obviously this is a linear relationship, so I can express f as a linear combination or an, or an integral, really, of uh, in your combination of forms of the type um, e to the minus uh, a dot ta. In other words, e to the minus sum over ij, aij, ta ij, Uh, e to the minus sum over i, a i, tau i. And I see I have to, I've gotten ahead of myself on the notation here. Let me, um, I haven't defined the tau i j's. Uh, actually, let me spend a little time doing with the, on this notation here because I know it's confusing. The fundamental variables here are phi 1 up to phi n. And from them, you can produce various combinations. For example, ti is phi i squared, just the radial variables. But I also like to look at Tij equals phi i minus phi j squared. Okay, so these are the things which appear up here in my sample uh, quadratic form. However, these are all, of course, functions of the phi's. Now I can um, also do the supersymmetric versions of these. So we have ta i is phi, phi i, phi i bar, and then adding in the psi's. And then finally the tau i j is the analogous thing, phi i minus um, phi j. Uh, phi i minus phi j bar and then psi i minus psi j, psi i bar minus psi j bar. All right, so uh, this function here, now it's a function of many variables. It's ultimately a function of all these phi's. It's supposed to decay, smooth, be smooth, and so on. But now there's many different directions in which it can decay. And so just like in the, when we were talking about this quadratic form here, I wanted to make sure there were no zero modes. I made sure that it decayed as a function of um, differences as well as uh, individuals going to infinity. Um, so right. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, there's going to be an, an analogous uh, issue of um, of an integral at infinity, which we want to vanish. And uh, so f has to, has to decrease as a function of these variables. 
uh, as a function, uh, f is a function of a real variable, it has to decrease as a function of the t's. All right, well, um, so I claim a function which uh, has reasonable smoothness and decay properties can be expressed as a linear combination or as an integral over functions of this exponential type. But the identity for exponential functions of the form e to the minus a dot tau has already been proven. All right, we just did the, uh, the Gaussian case. Um, so a dot tau is exactly the, uh, the type of the example that I gave. Okay, so um, without going into any too much detail, then we, we've learned that the integral of f of tau equals f of zero in C n, as well as in, in uh, just as it is true in uh, C one. Now, this may not seem at this point like a big deal, but it, we'll see how powerful this uh, fact is uh, in a bit. Okay, so um, now I want to use some of these uh, cool tools. And I want to bring back the self avoiding walk. Um, maybe I'll go down here. Um, well, I guess I, in, I guess what I should really do is give the analog to those formulas over there, which I gave in one variable, because I'm going to need those now for this self-avoiding walk. Um, if I do an integral of uh, some function of the phi's and the phi bars, this is uh, well, this is just to define what I mean by the integral d mu a. I just integrate f against e to the minus phi a phi bar and psi a psi bar. If I integrate f times phi i d mu a, then I just get the sum over j c i j df by d by bar j, d mu a. All right, so this is the analog of this formula over here. Integrate a phi becomes a d by d phi, or d by d phi bar. So an example then. Uh, oh, yeah, and C, I, J, so C is the inverse matrix. The most basic example would be the integrate phi i phi bar j, and I get C, I, J, the covariance matrix. Or more generally, let's say I took something a little more complicated, phi i, Phi bar j, phi k, phi bar l. Then when this five turns into a d by d phi bar, it can hit either that or that. So I'll get two terms. I'll get c i j, c 
CKL plus CIL CJK. All right, so this is just uh, the general fact that when you do Gaussian integrals, even though I've fancied them up a little bit with these introducing these strange notation for the measure, it's still true that the, um, you can evaluate integrals of uh, moments of the Gaussian measure in terms of sums of products of covariance matrices. All right, so what are the, why do I want to go through all this, these calculations? Well, I want to consider a specific matrix A. Um, I want an A whose covariance um, gives the weights of so Cij gives the weight for steps of the walk. All right, well, the simplest case would be, for example, uh, let's say I'm in ZD. Um, we could let Cij is equal to 1 or i minus j equals 1, so it would be the nearest neighbor walk. And then um, uh, and I'll just make, put it 0. Um, I guess maybe minus 2d i equals j and 0. Otherwise, so this is producing these, we these weights for steps in the ordinary d-dimensional lattice. Um, Then uh, let's look at the following integral. Let's say phi at 0, phi bar j. And then we're going to take a product uh, over um, i equals 1 to n of 1 plus z phi i phi i bar d mu a. And we're going to apply this uh, all these these integration by parts procedures. So that z is just another uh, just a uh, complex number, or what? Uh, yeah, z. Well, I guess it could be complex, but uh, it's just a it's a parameter. So now, what happens when I integrate by parts? Well, the simplest thing that could happen was be that this. 0 would be connected directly to j, so it would be termed with C0j. That would be a walk which, uh, if, it were, if the walk were able to jump from 0 to j in one step, then that would be one term in the expansion. If it's only making nearest neighbor steps, then you might need several before you got to j. Um, so if it can't get to here in one step, it's going to have to differentiate one of those guys. But you'll notice that once it differentiates, it annihilates a phi bar, then there's a new one, there's a new phi that takes its place. And uh, so then you have to keep on going. This, the new one then will have to differentiate a phi bar somewhere else. The result then is you're going to get a sequence of steps. And the only way this process will terminate is if you eventually land on this phi j bar. 
So here's uh, the side J, and here's the side 0. We get, let's call it I1, I2, and so on. We get C0, I1, CI1, I2, all the way along here. And notice that these walks are, uh, cannot um, hit the same site more than once because uh, this is a quadratic function, or it's really linear in uh, either variable. So once you differentiate it, it uh, can't be differentiated again. So this is a walk does not visit same size more than once. So what it is then is a self-avoiding walk um, where the, uh, the weights are given by this, these um, jump weights, the Cijs, which are the covariance matrix. And I guess there's a factor of z uh, on each vertex. Well, yeah, I'm be yeah, be uh, bear with me for a minute here because I haven't actually included all the terms in this expansion. Um, so this integral, let me call it I, and it's going to be a sum over let's call it self-avoiding walk, omega from 0 to j, um, and then we're going to have a product over ij in the, in the walk, cij, and a z, I guess, to the size of the walk minus 1. But then you have um, all the ones that were undifferentiated. So there's an integral of product over i not in the walk, 1 plus z phi i phi i bar d mu a. All this stuff, of course, is uh, independent of phi, so it wouldn't be nice if this term weren't here. <laughs> then we really would have the self-avoiding walk. OK, in order to accomplish that, I have to go back. And do that. All right, this, the integration by parts is unaffected by any of this, because th those derivatives are just hitting these phi's and phi's. Those, those guys are just sitting there going along for the ride. But when I'm all done, instead of having this, I'll have this. And now we have our magic identity. This is a function of tau. Integral of f of tau is equal to f of 0. And so I'm getting 1. So that means I can erase all this, and I really do get the integral as a sum of self-avoiding walks from 0 to j with these weights. Now this is just really the start of a, of a story. Uh, let me um, just take a minute or so to look at my um, Uh, our simulation is going. You'll notice that this was a simulation for two dimensions. And what you'll see is that there's a, on a log-log scale, there's a straight line relationship. And the slope is currently, um, I guess, 1.38. But I guess if you do it 
long enough, it's supposed to get closer and closer to 1.5. This is the mean square distance. Um, so that's telling us that the uh, distance from the origin, let's say the average value of x squared after t steps is going like t to the 1.5. So the square root of that will go like t to the 0.75, which is the famous conjecture for two dimensions of the exponent of the self-avoiding walk. Um, now just to give you a, a general background here, of course, if you do an ordinary random walk, this, this would be 0.5 instead of 0.75. We're trying to, in, in looking at critical phenomena for non-trivial systems like the self-avoiding walk, we're trying to look for new classes of phenomena that um, are non-trivial analogs of ordinary random walks or central limit theorem behavior with different exponents. Now, unfortunately, we're uh, a long way from being able to verify uh, the 0.75 exponent in two dimensions. What we can do at the moment is to go to higher dimensions, um, four or more. And in higher dimensions, these self-avoiding walks, don't, walks in general just don't tend to intersect each other as much. And so then you're in a weak coupling regime and you can, uh, you can work um, uh, using renormalization group methods. And uh, this has actually been carried out uh, uh, in a number of, of models, da David Bridges and Gordon Slag are actually doing this problem in four dimensions. Um, and uh, David Bridges and I have worked on sort of a simplified hierarchical version of this to prove uh, that you actually have um, t to the one half behavior with particular logarithmic corrections in four dimensions. Above four dimensions, then you just have ordinary uh, t to the one-half behavior. All right. Um, well, this 0.75 uh, should be, if you take a self-avoiding walk and, and cut it off after any steps, how far away you are away from the origin. Right, yeah. Whereas what you're measuring here is you're cutting them all off when they hit themselves, which isn't quite the same. That's what I was comparing about, too. Yeah. OK. Um, But they're, yeah, but they're, what they're doing is there's, um, that means each sample has both, a, gives you both a T and an X. Right. And they're plotting them against one another. Right. So it's not clear to me that it should be the same X. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's my complaint as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll direct that to the Center for Polymer Studies at BU. <laughs> <laughs> they should know what they're doing. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, actually, I mean, I think they probably have thought about this issue, but, and they can um, probably explain it better than I can. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, since time is relatively short, I did want to spend a few minutes talking about another cool application of the um, um, of this identity, f of integral f of tau equals f of zero. Uh, Um, so, what I need to do is prove this thing which I call a forest root formula. This, now we're getting us into a little bit um, the nitty gritty of this, ident this formula that integral f of tau equals f of zero. And there has to be a little bit of a paradigm shift here because um, um, the identity is the same variable. We're still working in Cn, but the interpretation of uh, what's going on is different. When I was talking about self-avoiding walk, the index variables i are sort of, speak, so to speak, the spatial variables. They live in the spatial lattice that we know and love for self-avoiding walk. But when I proceed to branch polymers, it's the phi variables that are going to be the spatial variables. And the i going from 1 to n is just going to be an index set, an ordinary finite set of numbers from 1 to n.
Uh, anyway, so I want to find um, uh, the implications uh, of the forest root formula. And specifically, I want to prove this identity here. Uh, this is a little, takes a, a minute to explain what it is, but I have my function f, which is the same sort of function that I've been talking about. It's a function of the t's and the tij's, the ti's and the tij's. And here, um, since we're now interpreting the phi's as spatial variables, I'm going to use a different letter. I'm going to use uh, w instead of phi. Um, superscript is going to denote diff partial differentiation. So this function, which depends upon these tij's and the ti, can be differentiated with respect to any of those variables. And the forest root formula is basically what I get when I take um, the identity which I've explained the integral of f of ta equals f of zero. Um, and I just go ahead and expand this in powers of the psi's. And you know, I did this already in the one variable case, right? Uh, in one variable, it was just f of uh, phi phi bar plus psi psi bar equals f prime of phi phi bar plus psi psi bar no, it's f plus this times f prime. Okay, I do this in one variable, but now I have to do this in n dimensions. And it gets, uh, and then you, plus you apply the algebra of differential forms to all the terms that you produce when you differentiate this in many variables. So I take this formula, I, ex I ex everywhere I see a, um, Phi phi bar plus psi psi bar, I expand the first order in the psi psi bar. What you're going to do is you're going to get a bunch of um, uh, terms here. Um, actually, I think I have a figure for that. There. Here's a bunch of terms that I get in the expansion. Uh, some of them. Uh, every time I have a line, that means I had a, uh, one of these um, psi psi bar terms corresponding to a, a um, tij or a um, phi i minus phi j or a wi minus wj. The thing is, if this produces a loop, then you get a relationship between the differential forms that I differentiate down, because I'll get um, w i w one minus w two w two minus w three w three minus w four and w four minus w one those are related. And if you take a product of let's say four differential forms, which have a linear relation among them, you're going to get zero. As a consequence, the, all the terms that I get w when I do this expanding out are going to um, have no loops. So that means what you call, it's what you call a forest, which is a collection of trees. Now there's another important uh, uh, property of this uh, expansion. All the non-trivial terms have to be of top degree, right? And you'll notice that if you just add up all the lines in this diagram, you don't get n, you get and short by the number of components of the graph. And so that means there has to be one additional uh, expansion out for each component of the graph. And that corresponds to expanding, instead of the, um, instead of expanding the tau ij, you expand the tau i equals phi plus psi psi bar. So this is, you can expand either one of these terms.
uh, but you, you have to do these ones for each component, and these, uh, each component, you have n minus 1, one fewer line than the number of points in the component. Anyway, um, without going into lengthy details, this is um, how the expansion uh, um, works. And what you get then is a sum over all possible diagrams, which consists of the forest plus a collection of roots, which are basically as you have to uh, uh, mark one point for each tree in the forest, uh, which is the point that got one of these type of expansions instead of one of those type of expansions. So that's, we call it a forest root formula. So it represents the function as a sum of derivatives of the function. Remember, every time we get a, one of these psi terms, it's, the, uh, it's equivalent to differentiating the function. So we're in a, we get a sum of derivatives of the function and integrated over n ver, uh, cn with a particular weight. So this is the analog in n dimensions of uh, this simple formula, which I already proved in one dimension. So I've taken a simple formula, integral f of tau equals f of 0, and made it look complicated. f of 0 equals this complicated sum of derivatives. Why would I want to do that? Well, the answer is that um, um, let me go over to, already, already, this is just going through the proof of the formula. OK. Um, the answer is that uh, you can relate uh, this formula to hardcore gases in d dimensions. So let's um, consider the, uh, hard, what is a hardcore gas? I to consider an ensemble of disks in d dimensions. So I just integrate over all the positions of these disks. We're in the continuum now with a weight which enforces uh, non-overlapping of the disks, so with the theta function. And you notice that I take a somewhat non-traditional argument because I'm looking forward to the, uh, the use of the t variables. I'm using the square as the argument rather than the, the absolute value. OK, so um, this is the so-called the partition function of the hardcore gas. And the integrand is just a product of these u weights, which are basically just uh, it's either 0 or 1. It's killing off those configurations for which the uh, disks overlap. I want to choose this as my f of 0, and then use the, uh, then I expand this variable here to live on Cn. Remember the, the formula was the integral, some complicated integral over Cn is equal to f of 0. Now I'm going the other way. I'm saying f of 0 is equal to that complicated integral over Cn. So my f, then I have to tell you how the f um, extends into Cn. All I do is I add the t variable to the argument that's already there. <coughs> why, why would you want to do that? Well, you see, this t is, this, is the squared distance in the two extra dimensions. This is already a squared distance in d dimensions. So the combination, then, will be a squared distance in d plus 2 dimensions. So it remains, keeps a nice symmetry to it. So you can, in fact, combine these variables, the, uh, the supersymmetric variables, if you will, the wij, with the original spatial variables into a yij, and they live in two more dimensions. And they give you a hardcore condition in d plus 2 dimensions. OK, so then we apply the forest root formula. Uh, what we're going to get, we're going to get a whole bunch of derivatives of f when we do this formula, right? 
what is f? It consists of uh, a bunch of these. Uh, here's f. Uh, when I do derivatives, I'm going to get a bunch of u prime. If I differentiate this hard disk constraint, I basically get a delta function. There's going to be no change until the spheres touch. At that point, they go from 0 to 1. So along all the graphs, uh, uh, the lines of this graph, see if I have that, yeah. This, so this is um, what it looks like. Every t place where I had a tree in a forest, it's forcing these disks to um, be kissing. Because that's the only place where, the, where u prime is non-zero. So this produces then a complicated uh, uh, integral over all the ways you could arrange these disks, kissing, there's n of them, into a tree diagram. And that's the branch polymer. Right? Yeah, so that's the branch polymer, yeah. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a couple of other, I guess, little issues here that I don't want to spend too much time on, but you know, remember that here I have a tree. The formula gives you a forest, right? Um, so you might have a bunch of tr a bunch of trees here, there, and the other. But um, <coughs> what you can do is um, uh, these derivatives all represent the uh, the two-body term, this uh, uij term. You also have to just to keep things regular. You have to put in sort of a volume cutoff. Uh, this function is supposed to decay as a function of the t's, right? So it's going to be f is going to have something like e to the minus epsilon um, tau i in it. And then you've got to let epsilon go to 0 to remove this volume cutoff. What that does is means that these uh, individual parts of the tree, this is the root. Uh, so the, the trees are basically rooted within the volume. But if you let the volume cutoff go away, they get farther and farther apart from one another. And uh, so that portion of the configuration space where two trees are um, near one another goes to 0. They become independent. And then you can, uh, this, when you sum over all the configurations, you get really an exponential um, of these uh, tree diagrams. And so then by taking a logarithm, you reduce yourself from the forest sum to a tree sum. Uh, so in the end, what you learn is an identity like this, where, as I said, you have to take a logarithm and divide by the volume. Uh, but then you get what I would call a branch polymer generating function, where you're summing over all configurations of disks or spheres. Uh, in d plus 2 dimensions. And the weighting, interestingly enough, has a reverse sign. So if you have a positive weighting for the hardcore gas, you have a negative weighting for these tree graphs. Um, and that's because, well, I guess ultimately it came from this minus sign in the forest root formula. Uh, or even before that, if you think about it in one variable, um, uh, it's this minus sign here. <laughs> so there's a real deep reason for, for why it has, you have to have a sign change. And in fact, the, uh, the hardcore gas doesn't have any um, critical point in the, for positive activity, but it does for negative activity. And um, so that corresponds to the critical behavior of the um, branch polymers. Uh, what you can then prove in the simplest case then is to, is to work in two dimensions where uh, if you have two dimensional branch polymers that corresponds to zero dimensional hardcore gases, which is simple indeed. Uh, if you have a, the partition function for a hardcore gas 
In zero dimensions means you have one point and you either have a particle or you don't. Either you have a one or you have a z. And you take a logarithm of that, you get the, the partition function of this very non-trivial system, the sum of all tree graphs in two dimensions. And so in particular that tells you the nature of the singularity not only the, and also the location of the singularity um, in the activity uh, as z approaches, I guess, uh, 1 over 2 pi. And three dimensions, uh, you can, it's not quite as simple, <laughs> but you can determine the um, uh, uh, free, the logarithm of torsion function of the free energy of the hard core gas in, th in one dimension, hard rods in one dimension, and it's the tree generating function, T, uh, which is, can be also written term by term. And then um, you can read off the behavior um, of these coefficients as a function of n to tell you how many branch polymers there are or the volume of branch polymers uh, of size n, either in one or two dimensions. That's, that's what this counting exponent tells you. It's the uh, uh, and the theta correction to uh, um, the exponential in n, which is non-universal. So, so if I look at a branch polymer, I guess we should stop because we're running yeah. out of time. But maybe you could just say what, what the, if you have n disks forming a branch polymer, yeah. equal weights, what the diameter is. That's, that's what everybody can kind of relate to geometrically. Um, well, this data relates to the counting, yeah. not the. But, but you also get the other result. Um, in three dimensions. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the exponent is in for D. Um, yeah, we do know what D is, but what uh, the diameter, what that exponent is, but I've forgotten what it is, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you showed that if you have n, n disks, right, and, and, then, and you put them in together in, in a, in a, uh, into a branch polymer, yeah. three dimensions, then that disk or spheres, actually, then the diameter of that thing will be n to the half. Okay, so you remember. I remember. <laughs> it, has a nice, it has a nice answer. Okay. Uh, all right, I think that's a good place to, to quit, and thanks for your attention. Yes? Well, it's a two-way identity, but uh, I think it's, uh, we've mostly used it to go from the hardcore gas, because usually higher dimensional systems are harder, right? So you go from the, uh, something you can verify about zero or one dimensional problem and learn something about uh, two or three dimensional branch polymers. Well, um, I think, uh, yeah, there aren't that many results that I'm aware of on, uh, even in high dimensions for branch polymers. I mean, there would be uh, a possibility to use this identity to, um, to work with uh, using RG methods to analyze the hardcore gas, let's say, in six or seven dimensions, where it, it's supposed to be um, more tractable. Um, and then um, that would tell you something about eight or nine dimensions for branch polymers. So you <coughs> don't get similar information about branch polymers in dimension four because you don't understand hardcore gas in dimension six. 
Um, yeah, that's that's correct. Although there there are some exact solutions, like hard hexagon model. Uh, back, there's a Baxter solution to that problem when they tells you what the exponents are. Uh, I don't believe it's fully rigorous, but uh, um, but then if you take if you if you assume that that is rigorous, then that would tell you uh, what the exponents are in four dimensions. At least for it was somewhat of a, uh, odd. It would be a kind of hexagons in two dimensions and spheres in two dimensions. It would be an odd, uh, an odd branch polymer, but it would make sense. Thanks very much. Okay.